Well, good afternoon to everybody. I'm Regina Valutita, professor at International and European U Union Law Institute of the School of Law, Nicholas Romers University, Lithuania. I will be moderating this international workshop dedicated to the legal assessment of Russian invasion of Ukraine. On the 24th of February, the world woke up in shock. Air raid sirens sounded in the Ukrainian capital and other cities as Russia launched a military operation in Ukraine, attacking different locations with missiles and dispatching troops to their country. Today, we close the second week of the military conflict and we ask if international law has any power against Russian aggression in Ukraine. The United Nations confirmed yesterday that since the beginning of the invasion, more than 1,300 civilian casualties, including more than 400 of killed, were verified. Thus, before we proceed to the official program, I would like to ask for a minute of silence to pay tribute to the memory of the victims of the war. Now I would like to ask the Dean of the School of Law, Professor Lira Yagulavicina, to address the audience and welcome the participants of this international workshop. Good afternoon and good morning, dear participants. On behalf of Nicholas Romeris University in Lithuania, welcome to this important event that gathers all of us to discuss the issues that are at the forefront of the agendas, not only of politicians, but also, I probably will be correct saying millions of ordinary citizens around the globe. And namely these citizens by observing what has been happening in uh, the past weeks in Ukraine are very likely, uh, like, very likely faced with the question, what happened to international order and security rules that we see that what is happening is actually happening. So we consider it as our duty as academic community to discuss and in a way demystify what international law can and cannot in, in such situations. Of course, as we participate today in this events, uh, many people might say that, well, there are more important priorities to be done now for, for Ukraine. And I don't doubt about that, uh, that's really true. But let's not forget that uh, along the physical war, there is in parallel informational war, and uh, it does a lot of influence. It does a huge damage to what is, is happening. So we as international law professionals, we also need, in addition to everything else that we are doing, we need to use our academic voice and contribute with legal assessment of the situation which is very complex. It involves a number of issues like definition of aggression, self-defense, methods of war, human rights considerations, and many, many others that will be discussed by our distinguished speakers today. Besides this legal assessment of what has already happened, I think it is equally important to analyze uh, the potential options from the situation, and in particular, the issue of international uh, responsibility. And in this connection, I would like to mention that the Ministry of Justice of Lithuania has already initiated inquiry into international criminal court. So the lawyers will have quite a bit to do in, in that respect. The panel that we, um, that we have today would not have happened, would not have been possible without the distinguished speakers uh, who kindly agreed at a very, very short notice to join uh, our discussions today with their contributions on those very complex, uh, numerous issues that involve in, in this situation. And I really sincerely thank each, each of you. Uh, let me uh, end by uh, remembering um, around uh, the same time uh, last year, it was a little bit uh, earlier, but uh, around the same time, uh, when we held a global event on uh, Tadas Kostyushko uh, legacy as the hero of liberty and freedom. Many of you might know about this personality. And uh, what was important that uh, Tadas or Tadeusz, if my colleague would, from Poland would, would call, uh, 
um, uh, it was very important that his legacy breached actually several nations of the world in his struggle for freedom and, and liberty. And freedom and liberty remain relevant today as it is not unfortunately given and uh, cannot be taken for granted. As long as uh, there are constant threats to freedom and liberty, we need to maintain and build the bridges among the nations with supporting pillars of security, uh, rule of law, and maybe even social innovations, because all of this makes us stronger. And these words that I just quoted, they were said one year ago, but I think they are very, very relevant and they remain relevant today. And I also believe that each of us can contribute to building in one way or another those bridges for freedom and peace. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Dean uh, uh, for this, uh, for this per perfect initiative uh, to have this discussion and for organizing this event. So to discuss how international law addresses the conflict, the School of Law of Nicholas Ramirez University, who is a close friend of a number of Ukrainian partners, universities, invited prominent uh, experts in international law, the speakers whom I would like to introduce very briefly. So the first speaker, Professor Christopher Borgen, uh, a professor is uh, uh, professor is uh, um, represents the uh, law and uh, uh, professor of law and co-director of the Center for International Comparative Law at Saint John University School of Law, United States of America. Uh, professor Bogan's research considers the role of international law in addressing political and military conflicts. Among his activities, he was a co-founder of the blog Opinio Juris and was the principal author of Legal Aspects of the Separatist Crisis in Moldova, a report issued by the New York City Bar. Uh, professor Lauri Malkso, uh, professor of international law at the University of Tartu, Estonia, the member of the Institut du Droit International, and since 2013, director of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, Professor has published on international legal status of the Baltic states, history and theory of international law, and Russia's concept of international law. Our third speaker, Professor Marko Milanovic. Uh, professor Milanovic is a professor of public international law at University of Nottingham School of Law. Uh, professor Milanovic has a very strong record of publication in human rights law, public international law, international criminal law, and the law of armed conflict. He's a co-editor of the blog of the European Journal of International Law. Uh, the next speaker, my colleague, Justyna Zielinskas, he's a professor at the European Union, uh, at the uh, European Union Law and International Law Institute at Nicholas Romeris University, a former member of International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. In his research, Professor focuses on various issues of international public law, in particular, international criminal and humanitarian law. And last but not least, Professor Bartolome Jean. Uh, Professor Jean is a chair of international European and European law at the Faculty of Law, Administration and Economics at the University of Wroclaw, Poland. Professor Kujan also acts as a, as a director of the School of Austrian Law and Vice Dean for Research and International Cooperation. And now I would like to also welcome our international audience who is listening, who is participating and staying with us this afternoon. And I would like to, uh, I would like to invite you to address all your comments, questions and, and remarks in the comments section. Uh, since we will proceed with the presentation and then we will have a special section of the questions and answers. So now I would like to start our discussion and I would like to invite Professor Christopher Bogan, uh, who will discuss how Russia's international arguments have evolved from the so-called frozen conflicts uh, through its invasion and annexation of Crimea to the broader invasion throughout the rest of Ukraine. Professor will consider the role of legal argument as part of diplomatic rhetoric and strategy 
as well as the importance of countering misuses of the language of international law. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to say, begin by saying thank you to the vice rector, to the dean, and to the faculty at Mikolas Romeris University, and in particular, um, uh, for organizing and inviting us to participate uh, on this panel. I should note that unlike some of the panelists, such as Professor Malksu, I'm, I'm not a specialist in Russian intellectual history and international law. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was part of a group of international lawyers that wrote a report considering concerning the separatist crisis in Transnistria, Moldova. Um, since then, I've continued writing about legal issues concerning this and other conflicts in which Russia is involved, watching in real time how Russia's arguments have changed and their use of, of these arguments um, in the context of, of each of these conflicts. Um, my topic today is the ins and outs of how and why legal arguments are made and the possible effects of those arguments on the structure of international law. Now, this might seem, as, as we talked about already a little bit, that it, it a touch theoretical, perhaps, um, in the midst of the very real suffering of the people of Ukraine. That suffering and how to alleviate it um, and prevent its spread is the real topic of importance. But I will make some comments along these lines, nonetheless, because I, th I do think that part of the bulwark against international brutality is the shoring up and strengthening of international legality. And to that extent, how we talk about law, how we make arguments matters. So to begin with, um, I'm, going, I'm going to talk about a few different aspects of, of um, sort of Russian argument over the years. And uh, to look at sort of short examples from uh, basically from the decades from the 1990s to, to today. Um, and picking out examples of sort of the relationship of legal rhetoric, uh, to, of, of legal argument to sort of diplomatic rhetoric, and also how that related to, to strategic issues that the Russians, uh, that Russia might have been thinking about. To begin with, I'll talk about the frozen conflicts, which is how I originally began working on these issues. Now, as, as many of you may know, as, as you know, the, the frozen conflicts uh, are, is a term that is primarily used to refer to the separatist conflicts in Moldova, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. The, uh, the, and, and as well, uh, to a certain extent, the, the conflicts between Azerbaijan and Armenia. The slide that I have here is from, um, is from The Economist from maybe about 15 years ago. And I, and I, I, I use this slide, I, I sort of brought it back from an old presentation because I want to show in part one thing that was not listed here. And that is you don't see as a conflict area, you don't, you don't see Crimea or Eastern Ukraine shown on this slide as a conflict area. Um, the frozen conflicts were, bef before being frozen, they were hot wars. They were, they were conflicts in, in 1991, 1992. And then with Russia usually intervening on the side of the separatists, and from there, um, entering into a phase of mediation in which Russia played the role both of mediator, but it also had, um, in many cases, troops on the ground in support of the separatists. So this combination of, of acting as a quote unquote mediator, but also being a conflict participant um, gave Russia of uh, uh, influence in the domestic and foreign policies of these countries as they tried to find a way to resolve the conflict. But constantly, Russia was sort of at the center of the discussion and was holding power in part because of not only its role in mediation, but also boots on the ground. Russia's arguments at the time include general mentions of self-determination and the use of referenda um, within the separatist areas towards, um, towards possible independence. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of moments, but I wanted to simply sort of mention that as some of the areas that were, that were discussed. During this time of the frozen conflicts, this was also a time of NATO enlargement. So you can see here some of the, the waves of, of NATO enlargement. And I mention it in particular because this has been one of uh, the main arguments that Russia has used in relation to why there is a conflict now in relation to Ukraine. And they're saying that it's in part having to do with NATO enlargement. But really, when you look at sort of the, 
the sort of the waves of enlargement, the the problem with that explanation is that is an issue of timing. So there were debates in around 2008 and soon afterwards about Ukraine potentially joining NATO. As before that, there were discussions about whether Russia would join NATO. But um, there is no, but th- the fact that there were debates in 2008 or so doesn't explain why there would be an invasion in 2022. So this is an example of, of an attempted explanation or, um, or an argument, but it doesn't actually resolve the problem. In fact, if anything, what it does is it probably hides what some of the actual underlying issues are. Um, and so once again, this idea of the relationship of rhetoric and argument related to um, how it relates to either prolonging or resolving a conflict. Now, in, in relation to talking about NATO, there's also the discussions and issues related to Kosovo. But I don't want to look at Kosovo in relation to Russia's arguments having to do with NATO's intervention in 1999. Instead, I want to focus on Russia's arguments in relation to uh, Kosovo's declaration of independence in 2008. The, this, has been, this is one of the main areas of my scholarship, the relationship between self-determination, secession, and sovereignty. And there's an enormous amount to be said here. But it, what I'm going to simply do is I want to focus in on sort of one example of an argument um, as a way for us to potentially talk about sort of more issues going forward. And that example of the argument has to do um, with particularly this question of whether self-determination leads to a, a secession as a legal remedy and how we would think about that in relationship to the sovereignty of the pre-existing state, such as, say, Serbia, um, in relation to, to Kosovo. The, the um, General Assembly Resolution 2625, the, General, the Friendly Relations Declaration, um, ha- restates a variety of principles of the United Nations. And in one clause, known as the Safeguard Clause, there's this language. Some states will focus on the part that I have highlighted in red. It says that nothing in in this shall be construed as authorizing or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. So some will point to the safeguard clause and say that this has to do primarily with issues of territorial integrity. Um, Others will focus on this highlighted part, which says of independent states conducting themselves in compliance with the principles of equal rights and self-determination. So here, they some will, will focus on this and say that there's an idea here of remedial secession, perhaps. And this has been sort of an area of debate and argument, which, I, which we don't have time to go fully into now. What I do want to point out is what Russia had said. So this is from its written submission um, regarding uh, in the lead up to the advisory opinion on Kosovo. Um, so it said that the Russian Federation is of the view that the safeguard clause is to serve as the guarantee of territorial integrity of states. And that if there was any issue of potential separation, this would be under truly extreme circumstances, such as outright armed attack, threatening the very existence of the people in question. So Russia, in its argument, set a very high bar um, in terms of whether there was the possibility of, of separation. And it said that really this clause should be about territorial integrity of states. For Mr. Lavrov, at about the time, had said that the separation of Kosovo would be the subversion of all the foundations of international law. Um, uh, Vladimir Putin said at the time that the idea of having a separation of Kosovo um, is a two-ended stick with the second end that will come back and hit them, that is, uh, 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 anyone supporting the separation, in the face. I mention this to show that Um, In the midst of what it was doing in the frozen conflicts, Russia was maintaining an argument overall that was very focused on territorial integrity of states, actually, and on the the issues of sovereignty of the pre-existing state, even though at the same time it was supporting separatists. Now, what you had months after um, the the, uh, Declaration of Independence of Kosovo and and its recognition by, by many states was you then had Russia's invasion of Georgia. Um, in the summer of 2008. And the ar- it's Russia's arguments in relation to that invasion then focused actually on self-determination of the South Ossetians, implying that, uh, implicitly tying this to the ability to secede. It was talking about this idea of, of protection of Russian speakers, that is not necessarily nationals of Russia, but people who spoke Russian, and also overall in its discussion, 
the idea of Georgian sovereignty was undercut and it was weakened in its rhetoric. By contrast, the arguments that you were getting from the US and the EU focused on Georgian territorial integrity, sovereignty, the norm of non-intervention. And I could say implicitly within this, the idea that key to self-determination was the self-determination of Georgia as a whole. That is, that is that the that the citizenry of Georgia overall was the relevant self-determination unit. At this time, there were also discussions and debates, since all of this is going on really intertwining at the same time and affecting each other, there were the discussions of European Union enlargement. Now, this was, this is an example of, of not of, in, in terms of Ukraine joining the EU, but in terms of Ukraine, whether Ukraine was going to sign on to an association agreement with the EU. At the same time that, that there was the issue of it joining an association agreement with the EU, Russia was also seeking that uh, Ukraine would join the Eurasian Customs Union. There was a lot of interesting debate about whether it could do both at the same time, but I'll simply note what happened in terms of the facts at, at, at the time, which is that uh, in, in March and July of 2012, Ukraine initialed drafts of an association agreement with the EU, and it was looking forward towards signature in 2013. At about that time, one of Vladimir Putin's top advisors said that Ukraine's Russian-speaking minority might break up the country if an association agreement is finalized. Now, I, I want to just remind you of this slide, which is that when that was said, there was no general sense of any type of separatist conflict in Ukraine. There was very much um, con there was very much debate between Russia and Ukraine over the status of Crimea because Russia had wanted Crimea um, had wanted Crimea part for a variety of reasons, including the, the the base in Sebastopol. But there wasn't this sort of ongoing issue of conflict there. Um, and then what you had in very quick in sort of very quick uh, uh, succession was uh, Ukraine does not sign the uh, the association agreement. Um, the a large amount of the populace of Ukraine is very upset. You have the Maidan protests, um, and you had then the the sort of the the crisis in Ukraine that stemmed from that, um, culminating in a impeachment vote by the parliament, and around the same time, the commencement of cyber operations and polite men in Crimea. This this idea of hybrid warfare, and then in March, this sort of very quick. Um, declaration that Crimea was de was declaring independence, and then immediately within a day, Russia had annexed it. At the time, Russia's argument at the United Nations mentioned the right of self-determination, but it began to pivot more towards an argument of historical justice and saying that the natural state of affairs um, had been upset when Crimea had been transferred to Russia during the U.S. Uh, had been transferred to Ukraine during the USSR. So, finally, the how how these arguments frame the the current expansion of the conflict. Ukraine has been in an international armed conflict since 20, the 2014 invasion by Russia and annexation of Crimea. There's been an ongoing support by Russia of separatists in eastern Ukraine, and that there's been this ongoing hybrid warfare. Russia has shifted its arguments. At the time of Kosovo, it was emphasizing sovereignty of Serbia. In South Ossetia, it linked self-determination to secession, and it questioned Georgia's sovereignty. Um, when it turned to Crimea, it then began with a self-determination argument, but it pivoted away from that, from the language that we normally use in international law, and it began to focus on these irredentist arguments of historical wrong, which is what is re-emphasized now in the current ongoing conflict, as well as its arguments about uh, whether there's genocide in eastern Ukraine. So... Here we can think, and this is sort of in, in closing, about the use and abuse of legal arguments in these contexts of these complex conflicts, hybrid warfare. Regularly, when we think about the role of law, we think about law being used to clarify the relationships of parties, to assist in ordering their affairs looking forward, planning for future action. And there is a tension, even in the best of times, between the use of law as to exert power and the use of law to, to support justice. But legal argument in hybrid warfare is used to muddy the waters. It is used to make things unclear in support of the party that's using legal argument in this instrumental way. It is to put adversaries on the wrong foot, to put them in a situation in which it is difficult potentially for them to follow their own strategy. Rather than a tension between power and justice, legal argument in, in hybrid warfare is an attempt at power projection.
Some of the examples that I've mentioned in, in, in this discussion of the use of legal arguments in relation to broader strategy has been this use of the rhetoric of self-determination. Because in that, you start claiming there are claims of rights, that certain, that certain parties have certain rights, and this Russian construction of rights of separation. This undermines the self-determination of Ukraine in relation to its arguments in relation to the, the, to the Donbass and Georgia in re relation to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. There's also the issues of the recognition of these separatist areas. Um, and in the case of, say, Crimea, Russia basically argued that Crimea had become independent. It was, um, uh, it was recognized, and thus you didn't have an annexation, but a treaty of merger. The irredentist arguments are not part of modern international law. That is this idea of bringing back old, um, old, old borders and boundaries. This reframes in what is essentially imperial power as a matter of law and justice. But this is not the language of international law. This is a misuse of legal argument. And in the case of, of the arguments of genocide, once again, the issue of the misuse of the term is at the heart of the current case in the ICJ, which I believe um, uh, will be talked about by the other panelists. So these arguments of revisionist international law are threatening the underlying rules that we have of sovereignty, of territorial integrity, the use of force, the recognition of states, the law of armed conflict, as well as other areas. So how law is a diplomatic grammar, how the term, it, it shows us how terms may or may not fit together, whether there is a, rel a, a relationship between self-determination and secession. It also shows us as a grammar how Aggression cannot be termed as a right. That is nonsensical um, in, uh, in diplomatic grammar. And that's because of the importance of international law. And that is why the importance of refuting the misuse of international legal argument. Because we talk about the tension at times between power and law. But what's also important is to realize the power of law. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bogle, for, for sharing your insights. We really appreciate your expertise in the field. And now I would like to invite our second speaker, Professor Lori Marksu. Uh, Professor Lori Marksu argues that justifying military attacks as preemptive strikes would take international law back to the period before the prohibition of use and threat of military force. Uh, before 1928, Bryant and Kellogg Pact and the United Nations Charter. This will not be accepted by the international community as it would take us back to the time when use of force against another state was, legally speaking, quite easy. Dear Professor, we're looking forward for, for the elaboration of your arguments. Thank you very much for organizing this and for inviting me as well. I, I can nicely attach my comments to what um, Chris Borgen just, just said, and uh, I think for me the main puzzle is this uh, uh, turn that we can witness in uh, Russia's legal argumentation, legal political argumentation concerning use uh, of bellum issues, namely the Soviet Union as well as early Russian Federation uh, basically perhaps up to 2008 or so, um, took a very conservative stance about uh, use of vellum rules. And it has not been something that has changed, you know, with one day, from one day to another, but it now has basically, um, with this justification that was offered um, for the uh, invasion of Ukraine, um, has basically started to use even the argument of uh, preemptive uh, self-defense. Uh, those who have studied international law know that the, although the United Nations Charter in Article 51 says that self-defense is can be used if an armed attack occurs, and actually, for instance, it was always a, a Soviet position that for that someone needs to attack um, first, and then you can, then the other country can respond to that in in self-defense. But but whether this is the exactly the case has been a contested matter between states. We we all know the Caroline case, the issue of anticipatory self-defense when 
you know, the attack by the other country is immediately coming. Can you then can you then react? Um, we also know that during President George W. Bush, the U.S. in its national security strategy made 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 an attempt um, to to basically kind of also raise the possibility of pre preemptive uh, self defense. Uh, meaning that no immediate attack is happening, but somebody might, for example, get uh, weapons of mass destruction, and then then there is a kind of political need uh, to deal with that. And and it was rejected. It was rejected by the overwhelming majority of the countries. And it seems to me that you know the subsequent presidents in the U.S. haven't insisted so strongly uh, on on this uh, right um, either and i think it has to be said with full clarity that this idea of very extensive preemptive self defense so to, as as foreign minister lavrov put it you know we do it so that in the future there there wouldn't be a war from the ukrainian territory i'm sorry but this is adolf hitler uh, because Adolf Hitler was exercising uh, um, uh, preemptive self-defense in his mind against the Soviet Union, against Bolsheviks, and uh, and um, and once we all, if we would open that Pandora's bottle, then then you know we we would in a way deny this that that the very idea of the United Nations Charter uh, was to make that illegal, to make that impossible. So this is one of the sad ironies um, of this current current war that essentially uh, Rus Russia is partly using Adolf Hitler's arguments. There is another sad parallel, and this is uh, this concerns the questions of, you know, how far Russia should reach in a way, um, especially in, in Eastern Slavonic territories. You know, in Hitler's mind, Austria was but he was, of course, himself from Austria, but but was just but one of the German states. And in the same same sense, um, uh, President Putin seems to be convinced, as he has written repeatedly, that uh, that Ukraine Ukraine is is has no justification as a as a nation that would belong, in a way, to a different uh, geopolitical family than than Russia. Uh, but. If I if I have to contribute, if I would try to contribute to this discussion today, I think I my main interest is is the question of why why Russia has made this uh, um, uh, U-turn, um, and of course, you know, it is sometimes almost funny how we international lawyers we we take these words at face value, whereas probably for many speakers for the state they see it first and foremost as propaganda I, you know maybe they despise international law they they use these use these words but but it's not uh, you know it, it's what you have to say to justify yourself i i think in order to understand putin uh one thing that is noteworthy about him is that he's actually a student of history <clears throat> he he wrote this um, article in the national interest the journal in the united states on the real lessons of of world war ii um and he has also there was a news some years ago that he invited leaders of the commonwealth of independent states and and he lectured them for more than an hour on the origins of of world war uh, ii and sadly uh, we still, in a way, live with these origins. At least they seem to be in people's minds, because look at what, what justifications Russia raises, denazification. So he, they see Nazis somehow, somewhere. And, or, or think about this Ukraine ambassador's um, um, reminder uh, from his General Assembly speech, namely that we sometimes forget it, that the charter still talks about the Soviet Union as if it would not exist. It has not been changed in the text of the charter, for example, that the Russian Federation is, the, is one of the permanent members of the, of the Security Council. Uh, so what lessons might, uh, might um, 
might put in draw from these beginnings of World War II, as these are the years that precede the making of the United Nations Charter in San Francisco in 1945. And I think one of the lessons really for him is a lesson of realpolitik. If you, if you are strong enough um, that you can impose your will on others, you can eventually get away with it because you know, when the UN is created, the idea is that UN member states are peace-loving states, but, but the winners, of course, declare themselves peace-loving. And, and, and by doing so, they also, uh, they also kind of, um, um, you know, put aside the question what happens in Eastern Europe between 1939 and 1941. Uh, uh, you know, in the end of 1939, the Soviet Union is expelled from the League of Nations because of its attack against uh, Finland. There is a, uh, there is also this uh, division of of Poland in in uh, 19 in the, in September 1939, and as well as the <clears throat> takeover of the Baltic states in a way that the war does not uh, break out. And it's very fascinating to study the various diplomatic histories of what is discussed at the Alta conference and, and those Tehran conference, uh, how, how the facts are, are in a way pushed. Stalin never gets a full recognition to those. We know it from the Cold War history that this question of borders is still very important at, at the Helsinki um, conference with the, when the Helsinki Final Act is adopted in, in, in 1975. Mm, but I guess Putin's lessons from the beginning of World War II is that new order is created by the strong. And, and when that happens, the, the previous uh, transgressions will somehow at least a little bit put, put aside. They don't matter so much. You know, nobody... Nobody talks in 1945 very much uh, about, uh, you know, secret protocols of Hitler, Hitler-Stalin pact. The other uh, lesson he might draw um, and why he has acted the way he has acted is that there is always, <clears throat> there is always uh, uh, support, at least initially, for appeasement. If you if you use the, somehow the salami tactic of, of um, you know, doing something... To your to your neighbors, because the interesting fact about Hitler's aggressions is that until he attacks Poland on 1st September 1931, he he actually meets the politics of appeasement. Um, this is the Anschluss of Austria in 1938, and this is also, of course, the Munich Agreement uh, when um, when the Sudetenland is is taken away from uh, Czechoslovakia. And I guess he, he must have interpreted uh, the Minsk agreements in a way, the similar way, because qual qualitatively, we only have a huge escalation now. But this thing starts in February 2014 with Crimea and then later in Donbass. So in a way, um, <clears throat> of course, Ukraine is not ready for a war at that time in the same, in the same way as it seems to be now. So there is maybe, you know, also their interest to stop it somehow at some point at, uh, at any, any cost with um, military problems in the Balts and, and, and so on. But, but the decision by, by the German and French leaders at the time to basically pretend as if Russia didn't use force to, to make Minsk agreements, real agreements, in retrospect, it, is, it could also be seen as as a, as a form of of uh, of appeasement. However, uh, the thing is, we say in Estonia, while you eat, your appetite grows. Um, of course, it seems now, looking at the reactions of the international community, that uh, uh, Putin really overdid it, and and now he has met possibly a reaction he 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 did not uh, expect almost full-scale condemnation of all fronts of these acts as, as illegal. In, in summary, I want to say that it is very 
very sad in a way that the argument uh, of preemptive self-defense in such a blatant way kind of takes us really back to the time, even before the 1920s. But I, everything I know about international law or today's international community um, tells me that there is no way that this argument of preemptive self-defense can, can really have a success in contemporary world. So, so there, will, there will be at least be no, no change of law based on, on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for your insights. And now, without any hesitation, I would like to, to invite Professor Marko Milanovic. Uh, Professor Milanovic will examine how the European Convention on Human Rights applies to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. The professor will talk about the current uh, interstate proceedings between Ukraine and Russia, and will discuss the uh, substantive questions of the extraterritorial extra applicability of the convention and its relationship with the law of armed conflict and the use of value. Uh, Professor Milanovic, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Regina. And, and, and I will also associate myself with, with the thanks uh, that my predecessors extended to you. I'm really grateful to you for inviting me and for being here. So be before I move to the issue of, of human rights and the European Convention of Human Rights in particular, let me just reflect a, a teeny tiny bit on, 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 on what Chris and Lowry were just saying. Um, I, I, I think that two key points need to be made. One is that when it comes to justifying its use of force on, against Ukraine, Russia has relied on uh, sort of imperialist expansionist arguments previously made by Western powers to also abusively use force against other states. And here the, the worst example that has already been mentioned is the 2003 invasion of Iraq. And Western states need to really reflect on the harm they have caused to the charter system and the integrity of the prohibition of use of force which enabled this kind of abusive invocation by Russia. And there is a, a horrible irony in, in watching Russian officials today make arguments that in many respects reflect arguments, for example, of the George W. Bush administration that Russians themselves made fun of at the time and today. For example, the spokesperson of, of the Russian foreign ministry today talked about biological weapons labs being uncovered in Ukraine and how, you know, they found evidence and that this will somehow justify what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Like, in, in a sort of, without any sense of irony, evoking, you know, all the weapons of mass destruction stuff and Colin Powell and his little test tube, you know, th that were justifying the invasion of Iraq. That, again, Russia itself had denied at the time. So that's one point. The other point is that is, is, is what Lowry just said. Despite all of this abusive use of the legal language, international law and international lawyers are 100% clear that what Russia is doing now is illegal, in fact, is the height of illegality, armed aggression, and that no past wrongdoing by Western states can in any way justify what Russia is doing today. No reasonable, rational, fair-minded international lawyer can say today that what Russia is doing is not a violation of the UN Charter. So that tells you that there is uh, normative power to international law. And it also tells you that even strong states that can evade, you know, being punished for violating international law still, you know, cannot breach that law without any consequence. I mean, just look at all the sanctions, all the bad consequences, all the ostracism that is being piled upon Russia today. And you understand that there are consequences to breaching fundamental rules of international law. Now in international law, like in domestic law, the rich and powerful can get, can get, get away with things that the poor and the weak cannot. This is a constant of human history. This is nothing unusual, right? But again, this moment today shows us that even most powerful states do have to suffer the consequences for breaching fundamental rules of international law. Let me now pivot to my actual topic, which is human rights. One interesting feature, if you will, legally certainly, of this conflict is that it is taking place in the shadow of the European Convention of Human Rights, the oldest and strongest human rights treaty in existence today, 
uh, and that both states are subject to the compulsory jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Indeed, the, uh, the Ukraine has filed its 10th interstate case since the events in 2014 started against Russia recently in order to obtain so-called interim measures of protection, the rule 39 of, of the rules of court, which the court granted. Um, these proceedings, like all the other proceedings, are not going to change fundamentally the behavior of the Russian state, but they show institutionally how there is a human rights mechanism that will at some point in time at least establish the wrongfulness of the conduct of the various parties. And both Russia and Ukraine, remember, are parties to this treaty. Um, similarly, the Council of Europe, within which the European Court and Convention operate, has also you know, enacted its own measures, including by suspending uh, uh, Russia's right to, to representation before the Council, um, at least while the, the, the aggression is ongoing and probably indefinitely. Um, it may well happen, of course, that Russia will withdraw from the, from, the, from the Council and from the Convention, but we will see whether that happens at any given time. So one issue of, of how human rights applies in armed conflict, which is this long-standing topic that scholars have been discussing for decades now, is a question of, of enforcement. You know, what do these different mechanisms do? What can they do in these types of situations? Another is a question of substance. To what extent do the rules of human rights add something to pre-existing rules of the law of armed conflict that already govern the conduct of the parties? So that's essentially the, these, it's these two points that sort of I really briefly want to cover in, in, my, in my, my address to you today. On substance, let me just flag a couple of points and then I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions that, that you might have on any one of these. The first point is that the European Convention of Human Rights is still the only body of law that governs the relationship between these two states and their own population. What Ukraine does to, to Ukrainian citizens and what Russia does to Russian citizens, to people living in Russia. So for example, a few days ago, President Putin signed a, a, a law a bill into law that you know enacted three different uh, uh, um, new criminal offenses that really very heavily inhibit speech in the public interest. Uh, one such offense, for example, makes it a crime to knowingly make any false statement about the you know use or, in, or, 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 or the way that Russian armed forces are being used. Uh, other arm, uh, crimes make it a, a, a you know other other offenses make it a crime to say call for you know uh, Russian armed forces not to be used, essentially to make an anti-war protest or anti-war statement, or to call for sanctions to be imposed on Russia or a Russian citizen. So today, thousands of people in Russia are being arrested every day, precisely because they are engaging in that kind of peaceful protest for peace. And the only body of law of international law that really governs this relationship is the European Convention on Human Rights. Then, however, uh, we have Ukraine, right? Ukraine has actually formally derogated from the convention on the basis of Article 15 of the convention. And it has suspended partly the operation of various rules in the Ukrainian constitution and in the European Convention in order to be effectively to combat the threat against Russia. But again, the validity of any such measures like seizure of property, uh, um, you know, mobilization, uh, curfews, and so on, that may be litigated or may be assessed at some, some later point. The only body of law that can ser serve as a benchmark of sorts for those measures is European Convention Human Rights. Then, however, there is the issue of whether hostilities between Russia and Ukraine are in any way governed by the, by the Convention. One problem is the problem that Russia is attacking Ukraine on the territory of Ukraine. And there is a long conflicting jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights on this issue of to what extent the convention applies extraterritorially. Um, the jurisprudence has been very, very confusing, confused and arbitrary uh, for one basic reason, which is that the European Court has until now been very hesitant to be the final judge 
of how any European state uses force, uses kinetic force to pursue a military target abroad. The European court did not, for example, want to examine whether NATO bombing of the TV station in Belgrade in 1999 was lawful or was unlawful, did not want to be the arbiter of every use of force by the US and the UK in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so on. And therefore, it has created these kinds of elevated thresholds of when the convention can or cannot apply extraterritorially. The last major case on this actually deals with Russia. This is a case called Georgia, Russia number two, which was decided last year by the European court, in which the court essentially said that the convention will not apply to what it called contexts of chaos, the active hostilities phase of an international armed conflict. The convention, the court would, would say, would, do, would not apply, for example, to today's Russian bombardment of Kharkiv uh, uh, or, or Mariupol or any Ukrainian city. Whether that position will be maintained by the court is, I think, very doubtful. To my mind, that position is categorically mistaken. And in fact, if you look at that particular judgment, which dealt with the 2008 war, by Russia against Georgia, uh, the, the, the grand chamber of the court was very split on this whole question of extraterritoriality. All the judges who served in that chamber are already retiring or have retired. And you know, in a year, two, three from now, I think there is very much space for the court to retreat from that position and to simply say that whenever European state uses abroad, they must uh, use force abroad, they must comply with human rights, such as the right to life interpreted, if need be, in light of applicable international humanitarian law. However, even in Georgia Russia number two, the court said that various other rights under the convention continue to apply. So for example, even though it did not want to engage in the assessment of active hostilities, the court said that the procedural duty to investigate potential violations of the right to life continue to apply. And also that any person, whether a civilian or a prisoner of war, who was detained during the hostilities uh, uh, um, uh, will be protected by Article 5, Article 3, Article 2, and so on of the convention. That means, for example, that again, as I said, when, when today, you know, in the city of Kherson, uh, uh, Russian military police are arresting Ukrainian protesters, the European convention will apply. It'll apply to any kind of mistreatment. It'll apply procedurally to whatever issues you know, of, of detention or control or deprivation of liberty might apply. Um, in the same way, when, when Ukrainian officials uh, detain Russian prisoners of war, the convention will apply. One particular issue, for example, is the parading of, of, uh, of Russian prisoners of war on social media that is done deliberately by Ukrainian forces. That is a clear violation of Article 13 of the Geneva, of the Third Geneva Convention we shall see whether the European court would, for example, regard that as a violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. So in that sense, even under the very restrictive approach that the court has adopted to these questions of, 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 of use of force in armed conflict so far, quite a lot of the convention would continue to apply. Now, will Russia actually take this into account? I mean, the answer is no. Right, so this is simply at this point in time, not a body of law that Russia is particularly interested in complying with. Just like the law of armed conflict international humanitarian law is in some respect, not sort of uh, uh, at the height of sort of Russia's priorities. Um, and that's, that's just how it is, right? There is simply no international police that can now, you know, go into a state that possesses 6,000 nuclear weapons and force it to comply with the rules that it has freely accepted. But nonetheless, international law does possess rules, it possesses language, it possesses procedures through which the unlawfulness of Russia's current actions can be assessed. Uh, and the European court is a, is a sub substantially powerful example of one such institution. Very recently, the court has heard one interstate case, the it has heard arguments in the jurisdiction admissibility phase of one interested case that uh, Ukraine and the Netherlands brought against Russia, 
that deals with various aspects of the situation in, in Eastern Ukraine and also with the downing of the MH17 airliner. Um, the court will likely pronounce on its jurisdiction sometime this year, and we shall see how long the merits of the case take. Um, so that's so much for me on the application of, of the European Convention in Armed Conflict. Again, very happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your brilliant insights. And before I will proceed to, to, to the next uh, uh, speaker, I would like to encourage our international audience to use the, uh, uh, the section of comments to, to ask questions. And we will, we will discuss these questions during the questions and answers uh, section. So now I would like to proceed with, uh, our, uh, with another uh, speaker, and my colleague, Professor Ustina Zielinskas. Uh, the professor asserts that this war is a clear instance of international armed conflict, and the number of evidence of war crimes is growing, and the avenues for repression includes both national and international pathways. Uh, professor the Pulsut. Thank you very much for the possibility to speak and to meet such a high esteemed colleagues and to discuss this, uh, well, I should say, a uh, very uh, terrible situation, to be honest. Uh, so, but uh, if to come to the topic, uh, and I will mostly talk about the international humanitarian law, there are perhaps few things that should be emphasized. I will be rather blunt and straightforward uh, because, and as I see, most of us are like this. Um, I think that uh, uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine for any lawyer who is acquainted with the basic concepts of international law and international humanitarian law in particular does not raise many questions on applicable law uh, because this is an international armed conflict. This time is not a proxy war with Russia's back separatists uh, about whom Chris addressed a lot. And even, uh, even that uh, Russia's back separatists was not the real case on the ground too, to be honest, because uh, Russia's military forces were directly taking part in hostilities, whether we will take, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the Donbass situation or whether we will take uh, South Ossetia and, and things like that. So, and it's uh, definitely not a land of legal confusion like it was in Syria, uh, when uh, it was very hard for the, uh, for the specialist uh, to uh, qualify that conflict. And even, even, even though there was a huge international participation, it still was considered as non-international. So in this case, uh, we are dealing with a classic international armed conflict with two states and their military forces engaging. And here comes some interesting issues. As it is known, and as Marco just pointed out, uh, Russia does not allow nor its media or its citizens to call this conflict a war. And uh, they are calling it a special operation. And uh, as we heard, it even introduced sanctions for the wrong wording. However, even Russia tacitly uh, recognizes that this is uh, an international armed conflict regime. Because when Russia uh, spoke about the so-called international legion, so about the people that are coming to Ukraine to fight uh, for its cause from other countries, Russia immediately said that they would not treat such persons as prisoners of war. Uh, even though without analysis of the situation, it's definitely a, a straight path to the grave breach of Geneva Convention. But anyway, the parlance that uh, Russia is using is clearly from the international armed conflict regime because you don't have prisoners of war in any other uh, Le I mean, legally, you don't have prisoners of war in any other regime, uh, only in international armed conflict regime. 
maybe there's a room for legal discussion could we call this invasion war in a classical sense or in the sense of the classical international law and there are many features to support this uh, because uh, well there was an ultimatum there was public declaration by russia the, it was followed by cancelling diplomatic relations by Ukraine. Uh, there are, if I'm not mistaken, uh, decisions to confiscate enemy, enemy state property by Ukraine. And also state of war is announced in Ukraine. But on the other hand, such discussion, whether it's a war in its perfect sense or not, is also quite futile. More of a mind game and it would not have any serious impact let's say, on the regime qualification, because as we all know, war and international armed conflict is the same from the point of view of regime. It could be relevant to some aspects of the law of neutrality, but the law of neutrality, it's a different topic, and I don't think that it is worth now to address it more deeply, maybe some another time. Therefore, the main body of law applicable to this conflict is uh, Geneva Conventions on Protection of Victims of War 1949, uh, its first additional protocol, uh, Ukraine and Russia are parties to it, also some other international treaties that deals with the international armed conflicts and limits certain usage of weapons, including Convention on Prohibition or Restriction on the Use of Certain Conventional Weapons, uh, also, Chemical Weapons Convention, Biolo Biological and Toxin Weapon Convention, Hay Convention on cultural, cultural Heritage, and of course, the whole body of customary law. And by the way, what is interesting that both Ukraine and Russia are parties to all the protocols of Convention on Conventional Weapons. And... Uh, looking how uh, Russia is using thermobaric weapon, well, it also raises a question whether such weapon could be legal following, uh, following these treaties. So now coming to the, well, most sad issues, the instances of the alleged war crimes that are committed. So, even though we are only in second week of the war and perhaps this war will take much longer, but now we see that Russia forces are engaged in indiscriminate bombings, indiscriminate shellings, both from tactic point of view, both from a weapon point of view, murdering, killing civilians. There were also some reports that civilians were used as involuntary life shields. And uh, it looks like Russia forces are deliberately destroying civilian infrastructure that is needed for civilians, including electricity, water supplies, centralized heating. And it, of course, causes humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, there were instances, attacks on schools, universities, including those with whom our university have a special relationship, uh, bread factory, and such attacks are increasing with every day. There was also an extremely worrying attack against nuclear power station in Zaporozhye. Uh, now we have a situation when two of nuclear power stations are under Russian control. It's, it's in famous Chernobyl and already mentioned Zaporozhye. And just today we received information that in Chernobyl there is no electricity supply and station is under the uh, generators uh, that should support the functions of the uh, storage of the of the uh, nuclear material. And if in 48 hours the, the electricity will not be renewed, a new a nuclear uh, incident could happen. Moreover, uh, personnel of these uh, uh, power stations are taken as a hostage. Basically, they are not uh, they are not let to go out and so on. There were also attacks on military and civilian hospitals, evacuation convoys. So uh, the evidences are growing and the def evidences are very worrying. Even though some of those incidents might not be a war crime, uh, because perhaps all of us know principle of proportionality when civilian suffers because of the vicinity of military objectives, 
or let's say uh, using uh, civilian vicinity as military objective and so on. But the general picture is grim. It seems that neither Russia's weaponry nor tactics seem to be oriented to minimize civilian casualties. And today are even more worrying signals that Russia's forces will try to raise cities to the ground. And uh, well, uh, under the official Ukrainian reports, there are damage to destroy 202 schools, 34 hospitals, more than 150, uh, 1,500 residential buildings, and uh, even more. It even makes more complicated with the total resistance that Russians are meeting in the occupied territories. Of course, uh, uh, the international armed conflict uh, is not a situation that uh, all uh, that, that only one party is is doing something wrong. On the Ukrainian side, uh, as Marco already mentioned, there are signs of mistreatment of prisoners of war, especially uh, following the prohibition of uh, public curiosity towards prisoners of war. They are filmed, they are shown uh, as a war booty and, uh, I don't know, some instrument for moral boost. There were also a uh, few declarations that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that some uh, kind of prisoners will not be taken. It's regarding artillery operators and pilots as a reprisal. So, and as we know, reprisals against protected persons are prohibited in international humanitarian law. So, all the situation is very worrying and tends to become, unfortunately, much worse. Now, uh, looking at the avenues of repression. Uh, well, uh, from the point of view of law here, we don't have much problems. Because uh, under international humanitarian law, the parties of the conflict has the primary jurisdiction to prosecute grave breaches of Geneva Convention, and it's not just an option, it's an obligation, and it is uh, directly put in Geneva Conventions that every high contracting party uh, shall be under obligation to search for persons alleged to have committed or have ordered to be committed grave breaches. And speaking about those crimes that I enlisted, it's clearly an instance of grave breaches that are described in various articles of Geneva Conventions, uh, as well as First Additional Protocol. And also, high contracting parties obliged to include those grave breaches in their own laws and provide penal sanctions for it. So looking at the national approach, or at the national legal systems, the criminal code of Ukraine in this issue is rather fragmented. But it has a few articles on war crimes, like Article 438, that provides for a violation of rules of the warfare. There is also an article of weapons of mass destruction, both usage and development, production, transportation, and so on. Crime of ecocide, crime of genocide. And uh, luckily, uh, of course, weapons of mass destruction have not been used in Ukraine, even though Russia is threatening. Uh, also, with the with the with the with the uh, nuclear weapons, as uh, and also blaming uh, blaming Ukraine for uh, pursuing uh, biological weapon problem one, uh, program, one of the many ju so called justification for the invasion. So, looking at the Ukrainian criminal code, it looks that Article four hundred thirty eight uh, the way to go because it encapsulates most of the grave breaches and uh, can be used for prosecution, especially having in mind that this is a no, not closed definition, but it is constructed with a reference to international law. So it means that this article is not uh, uh, defined only by national law because it provides for any other rules of warfare recognized by international instrument. Uh, Russian criminal code is almost a mirror of Ukrainian criminal code, uh, uh, not counting some additional additional uh, changes like uh, uh, the, there is a specific crime on uh, glorification of Nazism or something like that. 
So there are also also uh, foreseen crimes for breaching of laws and customs of war, so basically grave breaches, weapons of mass destruction, ecocide, genocide. So uh, having in mind that this is international armed conflict and we are dealing with a grave breaches regime, also any other state may as well start prosecution on the base of universal jurisdiction. And... Uh, Again, as perhaps all of us know, grave breaches are one of the few uh, regimes in international law of perfect universal jurisdiction where nothing else is needed except uh, being a party to Geneva Conventions and having uh, those crimes embedded in this international law. So, and this is exactly what has been done by some other states and Lithuania as well. And recently, uh, there were information that Germany is starting its own investigation. So a uh, national avenue, well, if there would be a will, uh, definitely is possible. I would, no go, I would not go into issues of international military tribunals or international criminal court, because as far as I see, my colleagues will address it. So I don't want to, uh, let's say, step into another territory. So to sum up, there is no doubt that from the point of view of international humanitarian law, we are dealing with a situation of international armed conflict. Even Russia tacitly acknowledges it, though for the public need it uses another word, wedding that is basically deprived of the legal meaning. Unfortunately, the evidence of war crimes are constantly growing and even official numbers declared by Ukraine and United Nations is not final. And it's quite clear that Russia's tactic of indiscriminate shelling and bombardments is an instance of war crimes. From the theoretical point of view, war crimes committed in this war are easy to prosecute. So what the problem we will have with the real effectiveness and real process. So it could be done by Ukraine, it could be done by any other state party to the Geneva Convention. And in most cases, uh, with maybe some exemptions when we have war crimes that are not covered by the grave breaches alone, it's an instance of, poor, of pure universal jurisdiction. So thank you for your attention, and that's all for me. Thank you very much, Professor Zelenskis. And now, without any hesitation, I would like to invite Professor Bartolome Kruchan, uh, who will discuss the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, with regard to the events taking place in Ukraine. In doing so, he will examine the declarations lodged uh, pursuant to Article 12 of the Rome Statute and their consequences, as well as the applicability factors. The professor will examine the scope of the ISIS's potential involvement and the practical modalities of prosecuting the international crimes committed in Ukraine. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, I should begin by subscribing to my predecessors, to my dear colleagues, in thanking the organizers for this uh, timely and, I believe, uh, uh, most needed uh, event. Let me start with an obvious statement that Ukraine is uh, not a party to the Rome Statute. Uh, Ukraine, uh, well, signed the basic document of the International Criminal Court in January 2000, but then given the constitutional law obstacles, well, stop, stop there. Uh, well, the question of con conformity with the Ukrainian constitution of the Rome Statute was uh, replied in the negative by the Ukrainian Constitutional Court uh, that uh, in 2001 declared that, uh, well, the ICC with its uh, uh, supplementary jurisdiction to the national system was not contemplated by the Ukrainian constitution. Indeed, uh, if we look at Article 124, Paragraph 2 of the constitution, well, there is a... Uh, uh, the prohibition on delegation of the function of the courts and also of the appropriation of those functions by other bodies or officials. So, so well, this was well the main obstacle. Yet, according to the to the more recent amendment uh, that uh, 
became effective in 2019. Well, a new paragraph, paragraph six of, of uh, well, was inserted to this uh, very provision and now Ukraine may recognize jurisdiction of the of the ICC as provided in the uh, as provided for by, by the Rome Statute. Well, interestingly, uh, Ukraine became the first non-party to accede to the agreement on privileges and immunities on the court in 2007. But uh, well, the fact that it is it, uh, the the state has not ratified the Rome Statute did not prevent it from lodging two declaration first in the course of the Maidan event. Uh, so the declaration, uh, uh, the declaration, uh, well, uh, granting the court limited jurisdiction over over crimes committed in that Ukrainian territory from. November 2013 to February 2014. And then in September 2015, the Ukrainian foreign minister, Pavlo Klimkin, lodged a second declaration under, again, Article 12, Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute, accepting the jurisdiction of the uh, ICC for crimes committed since February 2014. Well, I don't uh, have probably, well, time uh, well for uh, well uh, too close uh, examination of those declarations let me simply mention that those declarations were both based on the respective declarations of the parliament of the verkhovna rada of ukraine well when you compare those uh, uh, parliamentary declarations well with the documents eventually lodged with the registrar then, well, you can see some uh, uh, huge differences in terms of well, uh, the, how they have how they were formulated. Uh, in uh, uh, in uh, particular, well, the parliamentary texts uh, uh, mentioned and specified uh, categories of acts and their individual authors, and then, uh, well, the declarations finally lodged with the registrar of the ICC were formulated in more neutral uh, neutral man. Based on those two declarations, the prosecutor of the ICC, uh, Fatou Ben Soudan, opened a preliminary examination in 2014 and then later on uh, extended it pursuant to the second declaration. As we probably know, in at the at the very end of 2020, prosecutor, prosecutor Ben Suda uh, announced her decision to proceed with opening an investigation in Ukraine. Uh, well, after having found a reasonable basis to believe that a wide range of war crimes and also crimes against humanity, uh, uh, well, had been committed in the context of the situation in Ukraine. The more recent events are uh, obviously more familiar to us. Uh, well, at the very end of February this year, the new ICC prosecutor, Mr. Karim Khan, announced his decision to proceed with opening an investigation in Ukraine. And well, he also mentioned that he would seek authorization to open an investigation. Some further steps have been already mentioned uh, by uh, uh, by Justinas uh, well a few minutes ago and uh, well by Madame Dean in the opening. So well uh, the uh, referral by the Republic of Lithuania on the first of uh, March 2022 was then followed by uh, the coordinated group of. 38 state parties submitting a joint referral on the very next day, namely uh, the 2nd of March this year. Now, very bri briefly, let us pay attention to the potential scope of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Well, relying on the position by the Office of the Prosecutor, well, one can uh, very easily state that all crimes could come uh, into play, except for the crime of aggression. The latter crime uh, requires the ratification of the Kampala amendments. 
Uh, so basically the prosecution of that very crime, the crime of aggression would be excluded. This is based, of course, on the wording of Article 15 b Paragraph 5 uh, of the Rome Statute, and also the highly uh, unlikelihood of the Security Council referral. Uh, one should not expect too numerous groups of uh, the defendants, not only because of the present problems of how to capture and uh, surrender them to the ICC, but first of all, this is a problem of the limited capacities of the ICC, whose jurisdiction might be practically limited to those who are most uh, uh, responsible, senior civil and military commanders. Uh, let us be also fully aware of the complementary nature of the ICC. Well, as mentioned just uh, well, a few minutes ago, uh, the priority uh, is to be vested in national jurisdictions, not only that of the territorial state, so the Ukrainian courts, but also other states exercising universal jurisdictions. And well, uh, my dear friends, Justinas has, has just mentioned, well, some few examples of, for example, Germany exercising, uh, well, the, the exercising universal jurisdiction. We may, of course, uh, delve into uh, other alternative scenarios, like, for example, starting, well, uh, a special yet another uh, jurisdiction of purely international or hybrid nature. But, well, I should leave it aside here, perhaps uh, to be tackled later on during the discussion. No matter who, will, who is to take up the proceedings, uh, it is important to stress the value of gathering and securing the, 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 the evidence so that the future charges may be confirmed or not and could lead potentially to convictions. This is, I believe, well, the most important task uh, for today. Uh, without doubt, the examination of the events in Ukraine is a very complex task, task uh, which uh, uh, can provide an additional test, not only for the functioning of the International Criminal Court, but also for the prosecution of international crimes in general. So this is also a crucial test for how to tackle with those uh, atrocities, before the domestic courts. Definitely, the declarations lodged with the registrar under Article 12, Paragraph 3, uh, both provide, have provided and do provide necessary basis for the court's involvement. They might be considered, of course, as the postponement of the actual ratification of the Rome Statute, but I believe, uh, well, it would be in Ukraine's best interest to ratify the Rome Statute as soon as possible. And with that remark, if you allow, I will conclude. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to all the speakers for your val valuable insights and comments and remarks uh, and your thoughts. So now, now I would like to start our questions and session. So I would like to um, I would like to, to, to see all the uh, speakers. So, and since our uh, one of the speakers, Professor Dujan, will have to leave a little bit earlier uh, than we expect to finish with the discussion. So I would like to address a couple of questions coming from our audience uh, to Professor Dujan. Uh, so uh, the, the first question, so is there a legal or political merit to establish an ad hoc Trap tribunal that would deal with the crime of aggression against Ukraine, or, or should we rely on the permanent court to deal with the with the with the war crimes or crimes against humanity? And what would it take to establish an ad hoc court without the Security Council? Thank you very much for this question. I believe well, uh, we are uh, all fully aware of the legacy of of of. Uh, both ad hoc tribunals and, well, the inappropriateness of, well, following the, the route 
the avenue here with regard to uh, to the events of of, of uh, in uh, taking place in Ukraine. Well, both Yugoslavian and Rwandan tribunals, international criminal tribunals, were established as uh, subsidiary bodies of the Security Council. In that sense, the Council acted under Chapter Seven. So, for the moment, I would uh, well have uh, I would see no chances for well starting well yet another third or better say fourth jurisdiction after the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Uh, uh, well. Uh, international jurisdiction while well, having uh, uh, well its base in chapter in chapter seven powers of the of, of the Security Council. Of course, this is not an uh, the only option. Well, when uh, Rector Valutita poses the question, well, everyone is fully aware of the fact that well she alludes to she is alluding to the recent uh, proposal by a group of, uh, well, eminent international lawyers, among whom, uh, well, Philip Sands' uh, name uh, is worth mentioning. Of course, there, there has been this uh, recent, recent proposal. Uh, well, uh, following this, I believe, well, of course, apart from the traditional ad hoc jurisdiction stemming from the international criminal jurisdiction, jurisdiction stemming from Chapter 7 powers, uh, well, there is also this avenue of, well, combining international and uh, domestic elements. And in that sense, perhaps, well, the, the role of the General Assembly to overcome the, the impasse within the Security Council could be, uh, could be mentioned. Yet, I believe, well, uh, the best option to address international crimes would be well to uh, uh, to prosecute them before uh, the domestic courts of course this opens well a series of additional problems of of uh, securing well fair trial standards and so on uh, but well uh, for the time being uh, i would concentrate as mentioned on well gathering the evidence and well well, leaving uh, well the question on who exactly, which court exactly is to uh, well make use of uh, 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 of them uh, uh, to 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 the later stage. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Professor. A couple of more questions related to to prosecution uh, and punishment. So uh, the question. Um, uh, related to what what was already mentioned, so the national prosecution. So, uh, so as it was already mentioned, the German prosecutor declared that Germany starts investigation of international crimes in its territory, and if they try putting an absentia, wouldn't it preclude the ICC's case because of non dissimilar And and maybe a related question, which can be covered uh, also by the answer. Uh, so, how realistic is possible to prosecute Putin, considering that serving heads of state have immunity? Uh, let me address the, uh, the question. Well, uh, in two uh, in two steps. First of all, well, the uh, fact that well, uh, a person is a sitting head of state. Well, would have no bar on the activities of uh, international criminal uh, criminal courts. Of course, well, uh, this is only well part of my response. If we look at uh, uh, the probability of well uh, capturing uh, the sitting head of state, well, then well the sitting head of state would be of course more difficult to. To, 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 to surrender to, to, to the Hague or to elsewhere. Uh, so, 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 so in that sense, uh, I would say that the probability of, well, uh, uh, seeing Putin uh, before, President Putin before, uh, before the ICC, the ICC uh, would be uh, rather minimal. Let me also mention that the, fa the fact that, well, uh, when we look at the Rome Statute, well, when you look at Article 63 of the Rome Statute, then, well, it would basically uh, make no room for the trials in absentia. Uh, 
So basically for the trial, for the actual trial, the presence of the of the accused is necessary there, which of course would provide no bar for conducting, well, the examination, conducting the investigation at early stage. Thank you. So thank you very much for the answers. And, I, and now I would like to move on and we have a, a, a question to Professor Milanovic. Uh, Ukraine urges to impose a non-fly zone over the airspace of Ukraine. What would that mean from the perspective of international law? What are the risks and possible implications? Uh, okay, so, so thank you for that question. So legally, uh, there is no problem whatsoever in NATO now acting to impose no-fly zones or in the, indeed to intervene more aggressively on Ukraine's behalf because NATO states would be acting pursuant to the right to collective self-defense under Article 51 of the Charter. Every state in the world has the right to use force against Russia today in order to help Ukraine. The fact that Russia will regard it as, as an escalation, as aggression towards it, of course, is legally immaterial, right? So there is no right of Russia to self-defense against what are lawful measures of self-defense. But this will not happen, okay? So the fact that NATO states have the right to help Ukraine by force doesn't mean they will do it. They will not do it. They have repeatedly said that they will not do it. They will not do it because they are afraid, rightly so, of escalation into nuclear war. And so even though they have, you know, every right to help Ukraine in the way Americans, etc., and the allies helped Kuwait during the Desert Storm, they will simply not do it. They are confining themselves essentially to shipping weapons to Ukraine, which can also be justified by means of self to collective self-defense. Well, thank you very much. And we have another question for Professor Gilles Does the supply of military jets by NATO would amount to the, uh, to the military conflict? Uh, well, uh, it depends, but perhaps the answer is no. Because uh, when we're talking about the provision with, let's say, military technologies, weapons, and so on, so we uh, under international law we do not consider this as a kind of uh, <clears throat> participation in an armed conflict because uh, sorry I, I just would like to, to take a look at the yeah so but if we will look from the point of view of the law of neutrality that i said it's very complicated in this issue having in mind that now we have a united nations general assembly resolution it's not as strong as, let's say, United Nations Security Council resolution or of different, let's say, uh, character. Uh, but still, it seems that uh, that most of the uh, most of the states and world community has recognized that Russia's action is aggression, war of aggression. So uh, basically, uh, um, in that case, the issue of neutrality becomes very complicated. Therefore. Uh, there, there is a question whether a state, uh, well, state always has a right to stay neutral, but definitely states by supporting Ukraine is not doing so. And even, even Switzerland uh, decided to join the sanctions. So all these things in the, let's say, classical law of neutrality could be considered as an unfriendly act. But uh, uh, but just the provision of the fighters uh, from the point of view of law. Uh, would not amount to participation in the conflict. But for example, if the fighters will uh, will depart from the uh, one of another state, let's say, it, if if the fighters will perform missions from the let's say NATO states, and they will return to to those states, so that would be that could be considered as participation in the conflict at least from the point of view law of hostilities. Thank you very much for the answer and clarification. And now we have a question to Professor Bogan. Uh, what arguments beside the language Russia is using to demonstrate that the East and Ukrainian territories are a different people from the rest of Ukraine? 
since the understanding so far has been that a different mother tongue is not sufficient to distinguish one state people from another. So uh, to what extent the 2014 referendum in Eastern Ukraine could provide a valid basis for the argument of the right to self-determination or what speaks for and against it? Professor Rubin? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the, the right to self-determination is the right to self-determination of peoples. So at times in general rhetoric, we talk about what is a people. However, state practice has provided more precision to that language. Um, and, and as sort of summarized by James Crawford, what we've seen are sort of four different groups as being, as sort of being rights holders in terms of self-determination. Those groups are first, former colonies, or decolonizing areas. Second, states as a whole, a state as a whole has a right of self-determination. Um, we can also talk about territories or situations in which the participants agree that there is a right of self-determination. And there is also the situation where there is a non-self-governing territory, part of a state that has uh, that is not able to govern itself. So the first question would be, under these more precise terms, whether uh, the populations in eastern Ukraine and, or Crimea would constitute one of these self-determination units. And um, it's, I think, an extremely difficult argument to say that they do. This is why, as the question said, that simply different language in and of itself would not rise to the level of giving self-determination rights. Um, uh, so, it, of those four examples, the one that maybe uh, that you see sort of a gesture towards at times by Russia would have been this idea of a non-self-governing unit. However, in the case of Crimea, Crimea had it had an, an autonomous um, uh, parliament within Ukraine. It had a legislature within Ukraine. It actually had very significant uh, rights of self-governance. Eastern Ukraine was fully participating in, in uh, Ukrainian elections and so on. So none of these arguments um, are persuasive as a matter of sort of the specifics of international law. This is an example of where, you know, it's sort of painting with a very broad brush to try to be persuasive, but it's not actually really based on, on the specifics of law. To the, to the other extent, arguments that Russia made um, in regards to Kosovo is you know, when they talk, use some of the language that you hear now of the will of the people, in regards to Kosovo, they said, when we talk about will of the people in relation to the issue of Kosovo, we should probably be thinking of the will of the whole population of Serbia, not the idea of the will of just the people in Kosovo. Um, so the so previously, Russia had made arguments against this type of sort of vague language of in in relation to self-determination and had tried to focus in on on some of the more precise issues now let's say you know besides that what would the remedy be that is if this was a self-determination unit what would the remedy be the the strong I, i'd say the where the general consensus is in my view is that um self-determination units that the only self-determination unit specifically with the right of external self-determination that is separation it's most clearly in the case of decolonization. In the other areas, what you've seen is the international community looking more towards what they call internal self-determination, which would be assuring human rights and cultural rights within the existing country, not a right of separation. Um, this is once again, something that Russia previously had emphasized in its rhetoric prior to its increasing belligerency and aggression in regards to, uh, to in, to in uh, regards to uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and then U Crimea, and now throughout Ukraine, um, so the even if this was a self determination unit, generally speaking, we would not say that there is a right to separation. The strongest argument is probably along the lines of issues of human rights um, and cultural rights within the country in which they exist. In closing, just a couple of quick words about referenda. So it's important to note that the process of a referendum does not become a substitute for whether there's a substantive, for the substantive law of self-determination. I was just describing the substantive law for last few moments. The fact that there was a referendum doesn't overturn that substantive law and change it then into an issue of being able, of a legal right to separate. Um, to the other extreme, what I would even say is one of the things we have to look at is whether or not the referendum 
was held in a way that meets standards of democratic accountability. Um, and you have serious questions in terms of that, in terms of the, the issues of, of the referendum first in Crimea um, and, then, and then in eastern Ukraine, which was basically handled by, by the separatists. Um, referenda in the 19th century had been used at times in, in sort of very cynical manners, manners as um, with poor process as a mask for territorial expansion. So, you know, we've, a few of us have talked about some of the aspects of Russia's arguments for sort of reverting back to some of this 19th century language. At times, sort of the cynical use of a referendum that is not well, that doesn't have good process can be used as a way to try to mask what is essentially, you know, a territorial move. So, um, so the short answer in regards to referenda is that this doesn't change the substantive law. We have to go back to the specifics of the substantive law. And that's something that um, uh, I, I, right, you, you don't get the result of separation, in my view, um, uh, in regards to these cases. Thank you very much. Another question for Professor Milanovic. Could you kindly clarify if there are some quali qualifying elements to consider demonstrating images of prisoners of war in social media as a violation of mere showing should be avoided? And what about reshaping Im resharing images of the prisoners of war by other users of social media? Professor Milanovic. Thank you. Uh, so, 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 and thank you, Lira, also so for asking that question. So, the short answer is that this is a categorical rule. You can find it in Article 13, uh, Paragraph 2 of the Third Geneva Convention, where it says essentially that prisoners of war must at all times be protected, particularly against acts of violence or intimidation, against insults and public curiosity. So, Insults is a different thing from public curiosity. Public curiosity is the lowest sort of threshold. The, you know, historically, what, what this related to, you know, is a parade of the kind you had, I don't know, from ancient Rome to recently in Ethiopia, when prisoners of war are paraded through the streets of a city and, you know, the, the, the inhabitants are pelting them with stones or whatever. You know, that's what this sort of related to. There is no, however, bar to applying this to digital age and to, to the digital age and to social media. The fact that most or 99% of these prisoners of war have not been mistreated and are not being insulted doesn't mean they're not being made object of public curiosity. There is no reason to share their photos except essentially as a method of psychological warfare and this is simply categorically prohibited. There might be a very small set of circumstances where potentially you could justify doing something, some, something like this. You know, there's an allegation that Marco was detained and killed in captivity. And then it would be fine to maybe display my image and to show actually he's alive. But other than that, there is simply no, no justified reason for Ukrainian authorities doing what they're doing relatively systematically. The prohibition relates only to the state, but the state has a duty of protection. So the prohibition doesn't extend to private individuals. The state has a duty, however, not to allow these images to be out there so that private individuals can share them. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Professor Justinus, Zelinska, would you like to add some uh, something to the answer? Um, Marco, uh... Well, put it everything in order. Indeed, this is this is a prohibition uh, that's embedded in the Geneva Convention. I just would like to add one more thing. That uh, let's say I wonder what will be the fate of those people when they will be repatriated. So, because it, it's also it's not just protection. Uh, let's say this public curiosity. It's also a matter of protection of the person. So uh, that that person could feel more or less safe in the captivity. So not not uh, not talking about any let's say prosecution processes, but by by returning home, they might they might face prosecution, let's say for treason, for for many many other other things that uh, Russia is capable of doing. That's exactly right, and their families too, right? So th these are rules meant to protect a human person. And that's what they're meant to do. Exactly. Thank you for, for this clarification. And uh, uh, the last question for Professor Mark. So, uh, Professor, you talked about the evolution of, uh, of international law. 
And uh, in your opinion, what were the main factors to that over the time led to this uh, moment? Or to put it in other words, this international law as it stands now has a preventive effect, effect since we see that uh, military, uh, military conflict continue. Thank you for these <clears throat> questions because uh, I I feel there are two two questions in it and then I try to try to answer them them both I think so it's really really a broad broad one but also important one what took us here so one I said before that um, Putin is a student of history and a very interesting aspect of his explanations and justifications is a kind of narrative about what has happened to the Soviet Union, what has happened to the former Russian Empire, and quite interesting um, a criticism of the Bolsheviks in the Soviet history, namely the idea that they were too easily giving a recognizing right of peoples to, to self, um, self-determination and essentially that this needs to be, you know, corrected. This needs to be undone. So, if you want to fully understand um, at least the psychology all, of all of this, um, his or Russia today's Russia is not uh, approaching uh, this for only from the perspective of international law, but also from some sort of narrative of the history of the Russian slash Soviet um, uh, empires and and uh, the desire to correct it. And related to that, I said before that in this uh, concept of uh, preemptive uh, self-defense is, is an attempt to go back in time to before, you know, the Brown Kellogg Pact of 1928. Before World War I, the leading um, uh, British international uh, lawyer, uh, Lassa Oppenheim, in his international law textbook, wrote that the political foundation of international law is based on balance of power. And later on, this concept has sort of been dropped from from the discourse of international law. It's kind of the, you know, uh, too realist uh, uh, of an an idea. And and already after 2014, some, uh, mm, I would say, smarter defenders of Russia were like Karin Müllerson, they were trying to um, refer to this balance of power concept, saying that, well, it hasn't really disappeared from history, you know. And, and behind that really is this thinking that if a country strengthens, and many thought that Russia, you know, compared to the immediate period after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, has strengthened in, in power, so it, it deserves some sort of recognition. It is entitled to more. And and that you know once again um, shows the also the danger of 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 maybe going back to these pre 1928 even pre World War uh, One worldview of understanding how international law uh, works and and what it is uh, all about. So it's also it is also on Russia's side I would say a failed attempt to to raise or correct the balance of power issue. And then, um, you know, does international law as it stand now have, have a real preventive effect? Well, let's be honest, it did not in Ukraine. If, if, if international law would, you know, function perfectly, Russia wouldn't have attacked Ukraine. At the same time, I, I think we don't remember this kind of outcry or, or mobilization for, for international law for quite a while. So in, in a paradoxically, at the cost of victims in Ukraine, I wouldn't be surprised if the if the main main rules of use of bellum actually come out from this war strengthened, even although this doesn't have help the the poor victims in Ukraine now. Well, thank you, Professor. And one question from one of the speakers to all to all the speakers. Uh, so let's imagine that Ukraine has agreed to Russia's demands and sees Crimea and East Ukraine. Can international community recognize such agreements which were created, were reached by the use of force? So I'm opening the floor to any of the speakers who would like to address this question. <clears throat> 
So, so let me maybe try to pitch in. I mean, uh, this is a really difficult question because it's sort of, <laughs> it, it creates this tension between an ideal and a reality, a reality that we may, may need to end this war and the sort of normative values of the legal order that would thereby be violated. I mean, the legal answer is as follows. Uh, the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties provides that a treaty is invalid it, if it is concluded uh, in a way that's contrary to a fundamental rule of international law and norm of use cogens. Prohibition of the use of force, prohibition of aggression is one such rule. Essentially, a treaty that would be procured through the use of force would not be valid. On the other hand, we have had so many peace treaties that were procured through uses of force. And if there would be some such type of territorial settlement, the only legally probably valid way of legitimizing it would be through the Security Council, through some other UN body that would somehow confer its blessing on any kind of territorial session. Whether that will happen or will not happen, I don't know. The big issue is whether it's President Zelensky who signed such an agreement or whether it's a puppet government established by, by Russia after Kiev has been raised to the ground. So that's like the, the fundamental uh, uh, problem here as well. Are there any other ideas you want to announce from the speakers on this question or maybe general? Mm. If, if I could add that, um, you know, uh, the international law that we all learned, the one that was formulated in 1945, and this, this stipulation that Marco referred to in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is. Uh, is a reflection of, of that idea, you know, coming from 1945. Initially, it is still, if you take even, the, let's say, last 400 years of European international law before it became, um, um, you know, universal or at least more or less universal, it's a relatively short period of time. And, and uh, we have raised, or, or our ancestors have raised the the threshold really high with this uh, complete non-use of force. And then there is this tension, you know, uh, Marco can probably tell us, uh, you know, all the peace treaties that were concluded in the Balkans, for example, in the 90s, was, was there never, you know, force used? I think it's debatable and different ac actors have have different views on that. And we also know from the end of World War II that uh, especially in our region, you know, borders are actually uh, changed. And, and, you know, if you would take a revisionist view, you could also uh, say that in certain instances, I don't know, force is uh, used and so on. Think of how Poland was shifted from one place to another as, as, a, as a country. Um, so I, I think in the end, unlike Marco, I would say that the main important is not, not the Security Council, but really what Ukraine does. If Ukraine, and, and indeed I also mean the genuine Ukrainian legitimate government, you know, it could be uh, one of the successors of President Zelensky at, at some point, if they accept the deal that they give away some territory uh, to Russia and instead they receive, so to speak, freedom to join uh, whatever group of states they want to join, and get to be, you know, free of Russian domination. I, 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 it's not for us to tell it whether they should take it or or, or leave it. But uh, uh, you know, no, 1945 and having these very, very serious, very fundamental, very strict rules. It, at the same time, it didn't stop the history. It didn't stop the course of history. We cannot exclude that these kind of deals will also be taken in the future. Thank you. If, if yes. I could just say one very brief thing, and um, which is uh, going back in part to one of the things that Marco was saying before, you know, in thinking about this in terms of there's there's the law and there's and there's the the politics of it, and and I, I just want to sort of underline that, you know, there is the the prohibition of territorial expansion through uh, through the use of military, such a fundamental of the post-World War II system um, that I think that um, that any attempt at sort of sort of sort of you know coercive expansion um, 
on the side of the law is going to be an extreme tension, as as I think as Marco had said, with the the structure that we have, and it calls into question some of the the, the basic fundamentals of of the UN system. So, you know, I think that you know there needs to be a, a you know, I see a sort of a, a sharp break between um, the question of sort of the the power politics of it, and and the issue of of the law and legality of it. Thank you. So since we're running out of time, so I would like to wrap up the discussion since all the questions are addressed. And I, so I would like to thank all the speakers and all the participants. And uh, well, we see that uh, people around the world stand in unprecedented solidarity for Ukraine. And uh, well, as you have seen from this discussion, we also are very, um, we stand in solidarity in, in, uh, in what does it mean in terms of international law. So it's very clear, as you have heard, that, uh, that Russian invasion of Ukraine is a clear and great violation of uh, international law. So let's go. Let's hope we will see the end of the conflict soon, and then justice and the, interna the international rule of law uh, will prevail. So thank you for joining us this afternoon, and thank you once again for the School of Law uh, for organizing this event. And glory to those who fight for the freedoms, for the freedom, and uh, as we say, European values, and also. Peace to all of you and, and all people around the world.